I will be talking about how to build better machine learning models using human feedback. And today, human feedback and all those things related to um, machine learning is, are super exciting, and we have very um, exciting, cool progress here. And my talk will be how to use these techniques, how to use the opinions of humans, how to use the judgments of humans to make your machine learning models better. And that's will, what will, my talk will be all about. And if you have any questions, uh, I will I reserve some time uh, after the certain parts of my talk so we can uh, answer them. I'll be very happy to have this discussion. So my name is Mitchell Stalov. Uh, and my talk is Building Better Machine Learning Models Using Human Feedback. Uh, well, I hold a PhD in Natural Language Processing, and my original uh, PhD thesis was all about how to find the word meanings and how to connect them. And mm, I noticed that I need crowdsourced data sets to evaluate the quality of my models. And that's why I joined Taloka. Uh, Taloka is a data labeling platform I, that turned into a more complete uh, machine learning solution. And my research interests are uh, crowdsourcing, natural language processing, human in the loop. It's when you design a pipeline of operations that has some machine parts, uh, classification or checking or something, and human parts for validation or data uh, acquisition. And also my research interests include evaluation. I do care a lot about how to properly evaluate a machine learning system. It's very uneasy, it's very important. And that's what I really like. So here are my social media profiles on GitHub and LinkedIn, and let's go ahead. So uh, just a few words about Taloka. Taloka is a data language platform that turns into a more complete end-to-end -end solution for uh, machine learning. It includes the huge global crowd from 100 and more countries, uh, available in more than 40 languages. And we offer many, many, many things about around it to make sure that your machine learning processes will work well. And it includes many, many things like retraining, like um, annotator search and so on. And my talk is not necessarily about Taloka, but it will be surely be about crowdsourcing. And here's the outline of my talk. First, I will introduce the problem that we are trying to address and uh, provide some icebreakers to make sure we will be on the same page. Then I will tell you about the case of objective data, when your data is objective and you can obtain uh, the real correct answers from your uh, from your users, for example. Then we'll turn into a more difficult scenario of subjective data. And after that, we'll talk about how to use human feedback to increase the quality of your model operations. So how can you use human feedback to make sure that your model still work well and uh, how to detect if they don't? After that, I will just make the final conclusion. So the introduction. Uh, we all are building different machine learning systems. And most of the popular machine learning systems are recommender systems. So these are the systems that uh, show some list of items to the user. And these systems have to be very precise on what they offer. Uh, we often design different search or information retrieval systems. These are the systems that, given the query, provide the set of, not set, the list of recommendations of products or maybe pages or items related to the query submitted by the user. And uh, in user-generated content case, uh, it's very important to talk about content moderation. Content moderation is a huge topic. Uh, it is still an open problem in many cases, in many industries, because you have to deal with a huge amount of content from text, video, and so on. And to um, solve the content moderation problem, you have to automate these things. And it's not very easy. And since our users, in many cases, are real humans, well, our models have to be aware of the specifics of user-generated content. So you have input from humans, you have to take this into account. And there are multiple ways to incorporate human feedback. The first one uh, is the question, how can we obtain human feedback? And in the slide, I uh, showed a few examples. The first one is uh, we obtain human feedback from user interaction with the system. So if people click something, if people 
uh, do some actions in your web interface or in your mobile app, whatever, uh, you can record these actions to apply them as a signal from your users. That's a very important thing. Uh, another way to obtain human feedback is crowdsourcing or expert data annotation. Uh, it's when you sample a set of uh, data from your system, and then you use crowdsourcing platforms or use some experts to label the data, for example, spam or not spam, or relevant, not relevant. So you use explicit signal. In contrast to the previous item, it's explicit and user interaction is implicit. So you cannot uh, reliably say uh, that people think that's spam or not spam. They just click on it, for example. And human feedback, of course, can be obtained from publicly available data sets. Uh, research community is very careful usually about that. They do release some research data sets that you can use to train your model, to improve your model, or to evaluate your model. And that brings us to the question of why and how can we use the human feedback we received uh, in some way? There are three options. First is called model training and fine tuning. So your, uh, all the models are wrong, but some are useful. And to make your model useful over time, you have to retrain it somehow. Uh, and that allows you to enable the human feedback, the, human, the fresh human uh, supply data to increase the quality of your classifier or some recommender, whatever. You can use human feedback to evaluate your model. So that's a very objective signal that uh, shows that people, uh, whether people like it or not. And the last thing is what's called human in the loop learning. I'll show you more graphical examples in the next few slides. So uh, there are some examples. How is model training or fine tuning and evaluation are done? Uh, so we have input data. So for example, data set of uh, text and labels like this is spam, this is not spam. Uh, usually to obtain these labels, you design human tasks. So you have experts who are trained in spam detection that can provide reliable data. You gather data and human labels using this approach, using these instructions for these data items. And then you prepare the data for training, uh, <clears throat> uh, putting it to some parquet or TSV files, whatever. Then you use your favorite neural network or machine learning framework to train a selected model. Then deploy the model in, in multiple iterations, you turn this into production. As a result, you obtain model predictions. So you have a pipeline from input data through labeling and model deployment. In case you are using a pre-trained model, for example, BERT or GPT-2, whatever, or maybe uh, other models, uh, the only difference is that your model is pre-trained and you need a smaller number of annotated items, but the process is still the same. You have some model, you have the labeling procedure, and you have the model predictions. That's fairly simple. Now, the example of human in the loop. And I think everybody here uh, have seen chat GPT example or GPT-3 or 4 examples. Uh, those who are more involved in natural language processing research, they uh, witnessed GPT-2 and uh, more earlier models. But here's the idea how GPT works. Uh, first, OpenAI and similar uh, organizations pre-train pre their models. So they train the model to predict the next word, the next token. That's an, that uh, approach does not require any labels at all. So you now got a big model, <clears throat> a big model that can, that's trained to predict the next token. And that's all it did. Uh, but to make this model following instructions submitted by humans, these models have to take into account what is a good instruction and what's not a good instruction. And to do it, you need to apply human labeling. And OpenAI describes the approach called Instruct GPT in the following way. Step one, they collect demonstration data and train a supervised policy. So they apply what is called reinforcement learning with human feedback. And that, that's the first kind of feedback they got. They uh, have a data set of prompts. A prompt is a sequence of words, uh, usually saying some instruction, so like explain the moon landing to a six-year-old. Then they have a human labeler that demonstrates the desired output behavior. You can imagine that this part does not scale really well if you uh, need some expert knowledge, but still it's doable. 
Uh, so they have a human labeler who writes the text. And they have some machine learning machinery to fine tune the GPT-3 with this supervised signal. So you have text as an input, you have text as an output. And the model tries to create the text that looks like this. That's the first step, but that's not enough. And my favorite part is honestly here, step two. Uh, now model can output several candidates for, uh, for the results. So it tries to mimic the human behavior and it tries to output a few options, A, B, C, D. And OpenAI performs ranking task to show what is the best option, what's the worst option. And what's going on then? Then they train the reward model. So they try to build a model that given the uh, text provided by the model, outputs the prediction whether human likes it or not. So for example, option D uh, gets a small reward and gets, uh, option A gets high reward, which means that the model should put more text like A and uh, less text like D. And they use this reward model to uh, apply the technique called PPO, uh, proximal policy optimization, to, uh, to improve the uh, model that provides this outputs. So that's the very cool example of humanoid loop. And in my talk, I will partially uh, tackle this problem by showing you subjective data uh, usage methods. So that's the second example. I really find it really exciting. And most of you, I'm pretty sure, have seen ChatGPT before. And that's how ChatGPT does very well in instruction following. But now, so far, objective data. And if you run some production system, you have many, many, many problems in which you want to um, use the objective signal. For example, if you are running a movie review website, you might want to perform sentiment analysis. So given the movie review, classify whether it's uh, positive or negative. Or if you have some user-generated content, you have the problems of clickbait, spam, or some hateful speech or something like this, you might want to apply machine learning to, to handle this problem and so on. And to do it, you have to carry the signal. So you need the text and text uh, provided by the users, and you need somehow to gather the signal, whether it's spam or not. So you can use experts, you can use crowdsourcing, you can use uh, different uh, signals, implicit or explicit. Uh, that's how you build your input data set. Of course, there might be many, many, many other examples. And the problem is, if you have one item, for example, one message in your forum, and you want to build a classifier of spam, you can use, uh, you, you can ask one person to annotate one item. But the problem is, do you really trust your labels and your labelers? It's often true that there's only one correct label per task, for example. If it's a spam, you can surely explain that uh, you have a several set of rules, they might be difficult, that this is spam or not. And it cannot be subjective. There is an objective response. And crowd annotators, if you use crowdsourcing, are non experts in your task or domain. Experts do make mistakes too. And user generated content might be fuzzy. So the, this issue is usually solved using what's called consensus by asking multiple different people. And it's Fantastic that we have multiple labels per object now. Our message, we ask multiple people, but what to do with that? We have, instead of one label, we have three labels or five labels or seven or maybe more. We have to do something with these extra labels. And here is the problem of label selection. Suppose that we have one text and we receive three responses, spam, ham, and ham. Ham means non-spam in this area. So. Two people said ham, one said spam. There is an obvious, but not always correct indeed way to select the label. It's called majority vote. Uh, in literature, in many, many, many sources, it's called MV. Uh, so you just count the votes for every option, and you say the most frequent option is the one we choose. So now it's ham. And generally, it's called consensus aggregation or truth inference problem. And if you look at how different methods for truth inference or aggregation work, 
you can see tables like this. So columns are data sets, different data sets of uh, crowdsourced data, usually it's crowdsourced. And we have methods, majority vote, VAVA, and maybe more. And here's the numbers are accuracy values, so the higher the better. And we, we can see that majority vote and its variations like VAVA don't perform really well. So on every data set, it shows lower accuracy, uh, prediction accuracy uh, than other methods. And you can notice that there is one, one method called DS that works quite well. So it outperforms almost everything, almost everywhere. And it shows us that we can go better and we can obtain higher quality if we apply specialized methods that can into account can, can take into account something related to the specifics of how our, our annotation process works. And if you study truth inference models, if you look at them more carefully, you'll find that they are all built on different assumptions. And so what is majority vote? We just have labels, we have just uh, multiple uh, annotators, and we just count, are just counting votes. And if we do like that, we have labels which are similar, we have tasks that are similar, and we trust every annotator. We treat them the same way. However, it does not always work really well because people are different. Some get the task well, some don't. Some tasks are more difficult, some tasks are less difficult, and so on. So people have started, started experimenting with different formulations of the assumptions. And there are, there are a variation of majority vote called worker agreement with aggregate, which means that we run majority vote. And now we think that every response of majority vote is ground truth. And we reweight the annotator votes using the accuracy of the responses compared with the ground truth from majority vote. So we use majority vote twice. And it means that labels are still similar, tasks are still similar, but the annotators are different because their opinions are now weighted. Uh, there are other models like David Skin that use different formulations. It says all the labels are different because some labels appear more often. The tasks uh, still have the same difficulty, but the annotators are also different. And there are many, many, many other models like this. And here is the example of how David Skin works. And David Skin, what is really funny here, it was invented by, back in the 70s. And uh, the, prob the pro problem of formulation was like this. There are doctors who are examining the patients. And for every patient, they can submit one label, um, one diagnosis. And it fits our scenario really well. But we, instead of doctors, we have annotators. Instead of uh, patients, we have tasks. And then instead of diagnosis, we have labels. And suppose we have this configuration. We have five annotators. We have five tasks. And here are some labels. And David Skin is a probabilistic model that allows transforming this into this. So it tries to uh, estimate the, uh, the error matrices of the annotators, uh, popularity of each label, and use this information to predict the most likely uh, label for each task, which is very, very cool. It works really well. Uh, some data sets like ImageNet, if you use um, computer vision, if you do computer vision tasks, uh, include only aggregated labels, not raw labels. Uh, that's a problem because sometimes you want to estimate the variance of opinions, and this does not allow you to do it. And the problem of consensus is way too popular. There are so many methods trying to address this, so you will be lost if you try to uh, read about them. And uh, one needs to choose the model using the held out data set because uh, aggregation method itself is kind of a high parameter to your machine learning pipeline, and you need to be very careful about choosing it. There are some heuristics that I can provide you. First, on smaller data sets, like a data set with a thousand of responses, it's absolutely sufficient to use majority vote. It works really well. On larger data sets with tens of thousands of responses, Davis can works much better. It, uh, because on smaller data sets, it kinds of uh, underfit, Otherwise, works well. But the problem is, if you look at the majority vote or other methods, you will notice that they do take into account only the labels, but not the task content. And if you do moderation, 
you might want to take into account the text of the post or the image attached. So the aggregation does not take into account the task content, which is very unfortunate. What do we do with that? Uh, let's suppose that our input is a text, an image, or a video. So something we can embed to some low dimensional space, like we did this text, images, and videos. And suppose that we want to predict the build the classifier that predicts the class label. And it is possible to train or fine tune your model using the raw labels without aggregation. So how does it work? If we usually train or fine tune our backbone model. So we have a backbone model like BERT or uh, Vision Transformer or anything else that can embed your object X to a, uh, to a vector. So our classification function is something that is, for example, a, a fully connected layer over this backbone network. But if we train our model only on the responses, we will lose important information about annotators and tasks. So we now focus only on the content, but not how people uh, dis disagree on the responses. The good thing is that people studied this problem and invented a few methods to do that. And one of the simplest and uh, first methods uh, for this problem was called crowd layer. And it worked like this. For every annotator, it learns the confusion matters, AW. And now your classification function becomes like this. So you take your object X, you transform it to, into a bad embedding using the backbone network, for example, BERT, and then you apply your fully connected layer or a series of fully connected layers, never mind. But also you multiply this by the confusion matrix AW, which is trainable. And uh, since it's a set of trainable parameters, you can uh, apply the relationships that we know about the annotators to your machine learning process. And it usually improves the quality. Uh, if you look at evolution of these techniques, um, I can show you how it works. So we have two data sets, IMDB movie reviews. It's a data sets of, image, uh, of uh, movie reviews, which are texts, and the labels positive or negative. And there is a CIFAR 10, which is a data set of small images uh, of 10 classes. And we tried multiple backbone networks to evaluate this. And here, here are the methods. So first, we have majority vote. We have David Skin, the same methods before than before. Also, we have base, which is just training the model, the machine learning model, based on the raw annotator data. And we tried crowd layer equinal, two different methods for deep learning from uh, noise data. And we can see that uh, often it's just enough to train on the crowdsourced data, the raw data. But if we apply the more specialized method, like Conal, it starts working much better than before, than everything before. So if you use uh, these methods that take into account the specifics of data labeling, you will get better models that predict more accurately, which is very good. And of course, the uh, quality criterion here is test set accuracy. And training on raw labels allows to skip the aggregation step, but it loses information about the annotators. And this approach works only if we can represent our object as a vector. Fortunately, it's almost always true. And there are specialized models that incorporate annotator information to increase the precision quality, but you have to be very careful about the assumptions. And I propose to run a short Q&A here because we have the next section coming soon. So any questions so far? All right, so just a reminder, if you have questions, I'll throw them in the Q&A tab. Uh, Dimitri, typically what happens is we get to the first round of of Q and A, and um, people haven't started typing yet. So um, uh, uh, I would say let's continue, and uh, as questions come in, we'll just answer them in the in the next section. Great. So let's let's move on to the subjective data. So in the past, we were talking about the case when you have uh, like content moderation problems or any problems in which you can formulate what is the correct response. Uh, 
it's not always the case. Sometimes you need subjective data, like in the opinion example. You have the problem, for example, explain me something. And it's very uneasy to imagine the perfect answer. But uh, even if you can imagine the perfect answer, it's very uneasy to produce it without some expert knowledge and very scarce resources. So you have to break some assumptions. You have to uh, lift them and you have to deal with the remainder of the problem because the problem still remains. And my part now will be related to this subjective data idea. And uh, let's consider the case of learning to rank. Uh, in learning to rank, you have a data set of ranked objects, for example, queries and uh, documents. And you want to build a machine learning system that tries to answer new queries um, and ranking objects better than without it. And in learning to rank, the traditional approach looks like this. You have a training data set. Uh, after training your models, you have a few versions of your model. So they might be different in terms of hyperparameters. They might be different in terms of subsets of data or time periods of this data, whatever. So we have multiple model versions. And the traditional idea is to go through multi-step evolution part. First, you perform offline evaluation in which you have a predefined ground truth ranking data set. And this ranking data set uh, allows you to run the infinite number of experiments. So you run, you, you compute some evaluation score and you use the peaks data set. And it can be updated, but it's uh, the same for all the evaluations. And now after finding the best models, you run A-B test, or it's called also online evaluation. In online evaluation, you uh, just show the new version of your model to a subset of users and you record the interaction. And after choosing the best model in this scenario, you go to production uh, and then you double check that the new model still does not break your KPIs or it improves your KPIs. And that's the idea. So you need something to build this offline evaluation data sets. And offline evaluation data sets can be evaluate, uh, obtained using the techniques that I will show you very soon. Often the labels are objective. Categories are objective. Segmentations in image segmentations are objective and so on. But sometimes it's more important to learn the human preferences, like in the example I showed you before, the open example. What object is better? And that's the very important question. You don't need a very strict and detailed instruction to express your preference. You just like it or not. And that's a very cool thing. And human preferences are subjective and they are useful for ranking evaluation where it's not easy to explain the correct answer. But you cannot claim that there is only one correct response for this because people's opinions might be different. And we have an example. Uh, there is a query headphones and there is some result set, result list for this query. And we need to make sure that our classifier provides optimal order according to some evaluation data set. And here is can we, uh, how we can obtain this data set. Uh, this is often obtained using techniques called pairwise comparisons. In Talop, we call them side by side, SBS, but they query is the same. You show two options, exactly two options, and you are asking people to select the better option. In this example, we have the query catering disposables in the region of Dublin, Ireland. And uh, all the person needs to select is the best option, A or B. And how can it help to evaluate our search quality? There are some methods that transform these pairs comparisons to ranked list of objects that you can use as ground truth data set, with, which is very, very, very useful. And this is done using the model called Predatory. And it works fairly simple. It was designed back in the 50s. Uh, suppose that every object, for example, the product or link or something, has a latent score. But we don't know the score. But then we can compute the probability of object i to be more preferred than object, D, uh, object j. So this is the uh, fraction with some exponents. And this allows us to estimate this model. 
there are some efficient computational methods for this. And as a result, it works like this. Suppose that we have the following annotation feedback. It can be obtained from multiple places. We have two annotators, three tasks. And we have some uh, items to be compared, A, B, B, C, C, A, A, B. And the highlight means the choice. And this method transforms these tables into ranked lists of objects. In, in this case, we found that object A won most of the comparisons. Then we got object B, and then we got object C. So this very simple setup allows you to address very, very difficult problem of ranking evaluation by getting a subjective human feedback and transforming them into ranked list of objects that you can use to retrain your ranking models for recommendations, for search, for whatever you may want to use for, uh, for uh, the ranking problem. That's very, very cool. And you can use aggregation of these pairwise comparisons using the Bradley-Terry model and use the rankings you got as the ground truth data. And this ground truth data will be the way people prefer things. It's subjective, but useful. And since we don't have exact answers anymore, we can say this is the correct answer. We can now solve a more complex task of ranking instead of classification. Okay, questions so far? We did have one question just come into the chat. This is from Max. Uh, why, why have a probability of 0 0.592? Uh, it's not a probability, it's a weight assigned by the algorithm. So basically it works like this. It takes all the uh, comparisons and it tries to uh, estimate weights that explain this data. So it's a probabilistic model internally. It tries to find the best numbers, the best weights for the objects that can explain why we got this exact outcome. So after a few iterations, this process converts and we get this output. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and usually you don't need these weights per se, you might want to use ranks. So we rank one, rank two, rank three. And you can use these ranks to, uh, to transfer, to just uh, treat this output as ground truth data for your new model version. A follow-up question from Max. Uh, so there are three options, A, B, and C, and each time we are presented with two out of the three options. Is that right? On um, the Berkeley, we have three objects, not options. So the setup is still the same. So the setup is this. Uh, we have three objects, A, B, and C. And each, each time we present it with two options, yes, but um, we have to sample these objects. And it's a big topic, but generally uh, you should multiply like and log n uh, number of pairs. So it's a non-obvious thing of how to transform this number of objects to this number of pairs, but usually kind of n log n. Uh, like, well, yeah, thank you for the questions. That's a very insightful. Uh, the, my next part is called model operations. So we can now learn uh, from uh, objective data. We can now learn from subjective data. Uh, now let's try how, let's, Think about how we can use this information to improve your our models. And this is one of my most favorite examples of, of model uh, problems and data problems is this. So we had uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and it impacted many countries and many people's lives. And here's the example of how it worked uh, in terms of candles, uh, the scented candles. So before COVID-19, uh, if the comment or review for this candle had the words like no scent, it means that it's a bad candle. But during COVID-19, this phrase in the comment, no scent, does not necessarily mean bad candle because sometimes people lose their ability to feel uh, smells. So how do we know if the model stopped being useful? Here's the example. So we have some discrepancy and we need to be able to catch it. And a typical machine learning life cycle looks like this. So you formulate the problem, you gather the data, you validate the data, you perform some pre-processing like I showed to you in the beginning of my talk. You perform much of the work in model selection and training on many, many, many computational units. Then you deploy a model and think, okay, my job's done. The model's online. It brings value. It's not like this. The key thing is, 
uh, you will eventually fi uh, find yourself in that problematic position of what is called distributional shift or data drift. And distributional shift is when your training data differs from your production data. And why should one monitor the model? So you have to monitor your model to ensure it doesn't happen. And distributional shift is the change of data over time. So you trained on at uh, one week ago, on the data obtained one week ago. If your service or the news are changing rapidly, uh, it might be less useful. There are other problems like sample and inadequacy when the training set stops being representative and label deprecation, which means that meaning of labels is changing over time. And a label that was meaningful uh, one year ago, the class label is not useful anymore. That's called label deprecation. And uh, how does a typical approach for model deployment looks like? You have your data, for example, you want to moderate a comment or an image using your machine learning model. You have your model, you have your data, and you usually saw build some kind of API. So, uh, which means that for your object, you want to request prediction, your model makes such prediction. Then you save your predictions data in the database for further analysis, and then you return the prediction. So that's good, but it does not allow you to find the weak spots of your model. The distributional shift will happen and you won't notice that, even though you save the predictions to the database. Uh, you can obtain a different approach using uh, data labeling in any form. So exports or user-generated content or crowdsourcing, whatever. Uh, you have some platform that allows you to submit labels. Can be anything once you set up a project there. Then you sample from your database, your objects for annotation, maybe 1% of objects, maybe 10% of objects, depends on your workload. Then you obtain annotated responses. So you ask people to say whether the uh, prediction of the model uh, matches the predictions of people. And you compare the responses of model with annotators. If they diverge, you have a problem. But the good news is that you have just spotted that problem. It is not that useful. It's not that uh, easy uh, without it. So you can use these things to catch the problems. And OK, let's go to the question so far. Uh, there is a question uh, from Ali Haider Farid Shalbani. Uh, Sir, could you please explain annotator? An annotator is a person who annotates the data. For example, if you uh, are filling a Google form with something, you are kind of annotating it. Or if you are using a crowdsourcing platform as an annotator, usually you contribute some labels there, you're an annotator. If you're an expert who is tasked with uh, annotating labels, you are an annotator. Or if you're, or even uh, in Contest Strike uh, Go, they have what is called patrol in which you can watch how people play it and decide whether they cheated or not in the game, you are also an annotator. So it's a big concept and um, it uh, was, it is used in many, many, many cases. Okay, so more questions. I was gonna say that looked like the only one, so I'd say let's keep on going. Cool, but you can say, but I don't want any formulas. Or, or um, Dimitri, I spoke too soon. <laughs> <laughs> Their question came in from the chat. Um, how frequently do you update your model once it's deployed? What is the acceptable variance in the model? Mm, uh, it depends on your business case. So usually you have enough time. So uh, depending on your on the type of your business and dependent on the type of your content and the sensitivity of the content you have, um, it will be all be different. Uh, Sometimes it's fine to have weeks of this distributional shift. Sometimes you have maybe hours or days. But if you have some specific context, I can discuss this after my talk. That's a very, very big question. So I really like it and let's do it. Perfect. So I think that was uh, Sanjay in Zoom. If you can uh, provide some type of uh, business use case for your question, uh, we'll get to it. Yeah. I can speak hours about social elements, but let's do it a bit later, okay? 
Okay, so search relevance, but let's finish the talk first. Suppose that you don't want any formulas because, well, it's not enough to write a formula. You have to implement it and you have to write code, which is very uh, unpleasant sometimes. Fair enough. We have something to show you. And I want to show you a Python library that's called CrowdKit. That is developed by my team. And this library implements popular quality control techniques for crowdsourcing that you can apply for any kind of data you have. It features all the answer aggregation techniques that I showed you. It features all the learning from crowds techniques that I showed you. It has some quality and inter annotator agreement metrics uh, implemented. And it has convenient data sets, loaders, and transformers for uh, prototyping. It's an open source uh, library licensed by Apache License 2.0, and it's available on PyPI everywhere. And if you used scikit-learn before, its uh, API will be very familiar to you. So we have this snippet of code. So we have the function load data set. We have the class called DavidSkin that implements the DavidSkin algorithm. You don't you load data set called relevance too, which is search relevance data set uh, that we often use for prototyping. Uh, you have the data frame of responses and you have the series with ground truth answers. Then you initialize the implementation, you specify some hyperparameters, and you just use the very well-known method called feed predict to update the aggregated responses. That's for categorical data, for objective data. For subjective data, it's almost the same, the same number of code uh, lines of code, but the method is different. The predictory model that I mentioned can be run exactly in the same way. So you load the data set, then you instantiate your class and run the feed predict method to obtain the object sense scores. That's how it works. And we invested a lot in making sure that it works well, it works correctly. So we put a lot of things, in, uh, effort in evaluation of CrowdKit in a categorical aggregation, in a pairwise aggregation, so the aggregation of subjective data. We also have aggregation techniques for strings, for contextual responses uh, that we use in uh, audio transcriptions when you have uh, an audio recording and multiple people try to transcribe it and you can increase the quality of these transcriptions by using special algorithms like rubber. And uh, image aggregation for segmentations and deep learning from crowds. These two tables were in my previous slides, but generally we did a lot of effort to, to make sure it works well. And before conclusion, I can show you some live demos of CrowdKit, of how CrowdKit works. So let me switch my screen. Okay, so let's let's make sure it works. Share screen. My browser is here. Can you see my browser now? Okay, I assume, I assume you do. Okay, yes. And the first example is categorical aggregation with CrowdKit. So we have uh Let's, let's discuss the problem first. Uh, the problem is search relevance. We have um, a data set in the following form. We have the URL and the class, whether it's relevant or not, binary relevance. It's called binary relevance. And we have multiple votes for every link. So for every object, we have multiple judgments and we need to select the correct one. And for evaluation, we also have some ground truth data that we trust, and we will use it to evaluate the quality. So how it works? Ah, oh, yeah, there's some very important thing because my talk was quite long, and let's make it a bit funnier. Okay, so. Okay, we have some corgis, some crabs. Maybe some kittens will also join us very soon. Uh, we installed the CrowdKit library. Now we are importing it. And now we are loading the data set and the ground truth data set. Let's now explore this data set. And here's the format. We have the worker or the annotator column, the task column, and the label column. And that's it. And let's explain it for the ground truth data set. So it's roughly the same, the task is this. 
by the smaller number of objects and the ground truth label, zero or one. One is relevant, zero is not relevant. And let's use three different aggregation methods, majority world, Vava, and David Skin. First, we use majority world. So we just run the fit predict method from CrowdKit and it offers you the aggregated values. Same with Vava. The API is the same, but the class is different. And of course, a bit, a bit slower, but still quite fast. And there it's skin. It has to estimate the error matrices, the priors, and the true answers, but yeah. And we have future warning, but the current under development version does not have it, so it should work. Uh, okay, so we have now to evaluate. So we aggregated something, but we need to choose the model. And to choose the model, we need to use metrics. Let's use the F1 score. And we found that David Skin still works really well. So we have majority vote of 76% of accuracy. Oh, oh sorry, F1, uh, 0 0.7 F1. Uh, and then we have F1 for VAVA, 0 0.76. Uh, and we have almost 0 0.79 from David Skin. And to show you how it works here, to show this, it works like this. So this is the aggregated data. That's all about categorical aggregation. We can use CrowdKey for subjective data. And let's enable some important visual features here. So that's now a notebook that uses CrowdKey for pairwise comparison. And we here we will use a uh, data set called uh, code readability. And this data set looks like this. It has some passages of text, A and B, and the annotators choose the more difficult to read passage. So, and we want to order, uh, to, to build a list of passages. At the top of the list, we have the most difficult. At the bottom of the list, we have the least difficult. And there are also some ground rule data. So let's uh, import. Uh, the pandas to explore the data. Let's download the data set. Okay, and now we got to arrange our data frame to the form that CrowdKit expects. Now here it is. So we have the following form. The annotator identifier, the column worker, the left and right columns. So this is the passage on the left in the comparison passage to the right. And here is the label, so one of uh, these two. And we want to transform this into a ranked list of objects. To do it, we use the CrowdKit uh, aggregation module that has Bradley Terry and noisy Bradley Terry algorithms. And the difference between these two is that Bradley Terry just tries to explain uh, by weight the data you got. Uh, and noisy Bradley Terry uh, does the same, but it also takes into account that some annotators might be biased towards left or right preferences. And uh, usually it works better on real world data because people do make mistakes, intentional or not. It doesn't solve the problem entirely, but it has some leverage, uh, which is useful. So it converged. We now got aggregate labels. Now let's look at them. Uh, we transform the ground truth data from the input data set to the format CrowdKit and Pandas and Scikit-Learn expect. And now let's see the aggregated data from the two different algorithms. And now we see that there's some passages and there are some weights provided by the algorithms and the ground truth label. So in the input data set, uh, the numbers are not weights, but are grades. So one is the simplest and 11, I think, was the more, most difficult. And let's compare the ground truth ranks with the aggregated ranks. So we have ground truth data, we have the ranks obtained by the algorithms. And as a baseline, let's use the random rank. Okay, so it's just the random ranking of these objects. Now let's see how well it works. Let's use the indicator criteria, which is a ranking evaluation criteria, where if popular, and let's use the first 10 items. And we see that random rank has 0 0.43, which is not very good. The higher, the better. The regular breadlit area has 0 0.71. And the noisy bread letter has 0 0.75. So the same, the most smart algorithm, the smarter algorithm on the same data gets better results. 
Unless also can, but it also uh, it's also possible to evaluate the Spearman correlation not on the first ten items but on the entire data set, and we see that consistently all the methods of perform the random rank. Uh, and of course, noisy BT works slightly better. And now let's output the results. Here they are. And that's it. So you can use CrowdKit to transform your pairs comparisons into ranked lists of items that you can use to facilitate your learning to rank algorithms in the recommender system, in search, and in maybe other areas. Okay, so here are some examples. I'll put the links maybe to the chat or to the follow up message. And let me go back to my slides. Great question so far. Uh, just the one on, um, well, what if it is search relevance? But I think we mentioned we were going to answer that at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll do it in the end. Okay, conclusion. So we are almost there. Take into account how the data were labeled increases the prediction quality. We've seen multiple examples of this, and it's a very cool takeoff that you can use. Every model has its own assumptions, and sometimes lifting these assumptions allows solving a wider spectrum of problems. For example, you cannot address the problem of ranking using the methods that are not designed for ranking, but ranking itself is a much harder problem that requires lifting these requirements. And data labeling is needed not only for model training and fine tuning, but also after it is deployed. So we still need some human opinions and human feedback to make sure your model does work well. And some of the methods, which is really amusing, precede the problems we solve. It does not make them bad. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to have an additional conversation on this. The question is, what if it is search relevance? But um, maybe we can just talk a little bit about search relevance. Yeah, let's talk about search relevance. Uh, sure. Uh, so in search relevance, uh, you have the following scenario. You have the search system, which is usually a box uh, for textual, textual query. And uh, by submitting this query to the system, it outputs a list of items. And you usually have some analytics team that tries to evaluate the impact of, of search quality to the business uh, indicators. So for example, by misserving this uh, group of users, you're, uh, you lose this amount of money. So it's up to how you can tolerate uh, lost money and if you can uh, compute the, uh, the, the value of, of, of search. But generally, when it comes to your questions about the frequency of model updates, um, I believe you should update your search as soon as your inventory changed. When it comes to the search quality, for example, uh, you should really answer this question by the following reason. You have specific frequent, uh, so usually you have season, uh, seasons. And each season has different behavior of users in terms of queries. So in winter, people are more searching for jackets and warm things than in the summer. Which means that uh, if this behavior changed and your model did not adapt to this, you'll, have, you'll be in problem. To do this, you should sample the queries you got and ensure that every, frequency, every category of most and least frequent queries are represented fairly. And as soon as you, you, if you plot this graph, you will find the period in which you need to update your model. Well, once you do it, you should enable sampling of your queries, sampling of your results, and annotation of uh, preferences of humans to, in, to retrain your model. Depending on your business, and this is an analysis of your business, in generic store with FEM, FEM CG, it should be maybe weeks or days. I think it's weeks. Uh, in maybe some construction markets and so on, it may be months. Okay, so. sounds good. And um, uh, Max, I want you to know, I see your question, but I am gonna save it for the end because I think it's a good one for us to end on. 
Um, uh, this next question says, sir, if we add a new data, if we add new data with this model, will prefer will our preferences change or will it affect um, what effect will it have on the results? Um, to answer this question, I have to ask uh, what part what, what model exactly uh, do you mean? Because uh, my general response of if you have different data, uh, you have a different model. So, uh, of course, the performance of the model will change if you change the data set. And there is the, the entire uh, direction in data science called data centric AI, in which you have the fixed model the architecture, but you have uh, to do something with the data to squeeze the maximum out of this model. Mm, so, please add more context so I can approach your question better. Okay. And then, uh, uh, Max, here comes your question. So. So Dimitri, if somebody wants to continue learning about this topic, um, what sh what where should they go next? Do you do you have any resources that you would suggest? Um, uh, uh, what's next in terms of your recommendations for for learning endeavors? Um, sure. So my talk has two parts: objective data, subjective data, and model monitoring. And for model monitoring, the best thing is to implement it yourself. Uh, there are some solutions for data drift detection and you can just dive into GitHub, how it works and uh, to try to implement it uh, in your uh, particular case. Regarding subjective data, uh, I think I can recommend a few research papers that show a very nice overview of the problem. When it come and also I I posted I think one year ago or maybe less uh, a post on towards science on how to evaluate search relevance using these pairwise comparisons and subjective data. Mm -hmm. I can just post it to the follow up message if possible. Then uh, when it comes to objective data, I can also recommend a research paper and I can also recommend to uh, yeah two research papers of the overview of these topics and the fact that the research papers doesn't mean that they are hard to read. So they are like very illustrative and they have some tables with the results and you'll feel the general uh, direction of this of this field. Uh, Dimitri, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you uh, spending the time with us. I know it wasn't just this one hour that we had. I know you put in some effort.